y'all, I'm Kitty, and this podcast is mine, Missing, Murdered, Unidentified in New England. I cover cases from the New England states of Connecticut, Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Vermont. Each episode takes place over the years of January 1st, 2010 to December 31st, 2020. And based on sources, some episodes will be long and others will be short as these cases don't generally have much information available. All of the research, scripting, opinions, and mistakes here are my own, and I will offer updates and corrections as needed. I do not trigger warn for wounds as they are a necessary part of the narrative. I will trigger warn for such topics as animal death, domestic violence, suicide, etc. as needed. Now with that, please listen in as I tell you about April 2012. April 17th, 2012. Family and friends still adorn Dennis Jordan, a.k.a. Mike, Michael, and Big Mike's online memorial with heartfelt notes, including my homie, my best friend, I went to your gravesite yesterday, still can't believe you're gone. I sat there and thought about all the crazy stuff we used to do, and boy, did we do some crazy stuff. I miss you, big homie. I will never forget you. Another message coming from Dennis's big sister Linda is, No matter how much time has passed, the pain will never go away. It feels like yesterday when you were taken from us. I love you very much, little brother, and miss you more than life. Until we meet again. 37-year-old Dennis lived on Windsor Court in Springfield, Mass., and was a graduate of the area schools. Dennis worked as a gas attendant at Shell and Bloodlow and was previously employed at Springfield College, Sullivan Paper, and Jay Pollop. Dennis's parents survived him, as did his sisters Linda and Deborah, his brothers David and Donald, and his own children, Dennis, Latoya, Lalasia, and Trey, as well as his grandson Jordan. An unknown person shot Dennis in the head outside of the apartment buildings in the Old Hill neighborhood of Springfield, Massachusetts on April 17th, 2012. Police say this is not a gang-related murder, though it could be drug-related, but only due to the high drug activity in the area. Police were called to the rear of 528 Union Street, a four-story building at the corner of Union and Orleans at 11.15 p.m. Dennis's brother, David, heard about the shooting and went to the scene only to see his brother, quote, laying down, not moving. He was just laying there. There were a lot of police there, and I couldn't believe it. Dennis was friendly and well-liked, and was always cracking jokes and always smiling and helping people out, and is now buried in Oak Hill Cemetery in Springfield, Mass. Please call 1-413-787-6355. April 18th, 2012. Dimitri Jones was shot outside the Price Right at 871 River Street Hyde Park, Mass. on April 18, 2012. This 20-year-old was slain by someone who likely got away in a white suburban spotted driving down River Street into Hyde Park. Please call 1-413-787-6355. April 19, 2012. Kaylee. Your smile could light up a room, and your personality could make everyone laugh. Anthony Harrison recalls of his daughter Kaylee. Kaylee's cousins recall a cheerful little girl, one who tried to turn down the head start offered at her family Easter egg hunt in order to have her cousins come search with her, then promptly sat down to snack on the first egg she found. Kaylee Ann Harrison, nicknamed Cal, was born July 27, 2009, and is a white female. Kaylee was two foot six inches to three feet tall when last seen at the creek area of Long Beach and Cape Hedge in Rockport, Massachusetts. Kaylee has short brown hair, blue-gray eyes, and freckles under her eyes as well as dimples. Kaylee was last seen wearing a light pink shirt and bright pink capri pants. Kaylee was a little girl with a big smile and a perky ponytail. Kaylee's favorite color is purple. She loves her sister Elizabeth and loves string cheese. Kaylee was described as a quiet child who never cried or whined, 
was always eager to hang out with her family and thoroughly enjoyed life. A man, wearing a ribbon in remembrance of Kaylee, who would not give his name but said he was a friend of Kaylee's mother, Allison, said of Kaylee to reporters at the beach. She brought smiles to so many faces, especially her own. Most weekends, Kaylee could be found at her cousin's house having sleepovers with her 7 to 12 year old cousins. Kaylee was overall a normal, energetic, and sweet child. The day was gray and storm tossed when two year, nine month old Kaylee went to the beach with her mom, Allison, her four year old sister, Elizabeth, and her grandparents' dog, Lucas, on April 19th, 2012. The family played with the dog with a ball for a while, ran up and down the beach, and had an overall delightful day. Shortly after high tide, around 1 to 2 p.m., Allison tossed or kicked the ball too far and went to retrieve it. Anyways, Allison got the girl situated next to the wall on the sparsely populated beach. This was a wall near a deceivingly ripping tidal stream, and it should be noted the girls were not left to play on the bridge over Saratoga Creek itself. Kaylee was last seen with Elizabeth getting ready to build a sand castle and playing near a rock wall at the estuary where water emptied out into the sea. While Allison was gone for maybe one to two minutes and checked in on the girls as she hurried to get the ball, when she turned around the last time, only Elizabeth could be seen raising her arms and saying Kaylee's gone. Kaylee had been playing by the swollen creek when the tide was going out. The water flowed into the salt marsh and the beach dropped sharply. The beach the small family was at was known for its deep waters and strong currents, and the day Kaylee went missing, the undertow was strong and the current was going out. According to her uncle David, Kaylee didn't really like water and was actually known for her dislike of water. Allison didn't immediately panic or call the police because she didn't think that Kaylee could really be gone, being quoted as saying, if she fell in the spot where they were, she would not have been instantly swept out to sea. It's a little creek, little estuary that kids play in, and the footbridge had a fence. Allison grabbed Elizabeth and ran around the beach looking for Kaylee. By the time police were called, because Allison didn't have a cell phone, Kaylee could have been swept out to sea. Land and sea searches occurred, though Kaylee has never been found. The sea searches had to be called off due to extreme weather conditions, including rough waters and high winds that were experienced during the three days following Kaylee's disappearance. The waves were between 10 to 12 feet high. Searches went up to 220 miles offshore and were stopped after one week after no success in inclement weather. There were no signs of Kaylee via divers, sonar, dogs, helicopters, boats, or boots on the ground searches. About three weeks after Kaylee vanished, a skin-like material washed ashore near where Kaylee was last seen. Allison was called under scrutiny for what many call a preventable mistake, as Kaylee's disappearance is considered a suspected accident, though the possibility of abduction was briefly considered. Kaylee's parents concede that abduction is very, very unlikely, but it is the only way to have hope. Sources discuss a cigarette-smoking man who might have possibly taken Kaylee, according to a vague description little Elizabeth mentioned, though when pressed for more details, the story began to fall apart as Elizabeth didn't want to talk about the situation anymore to either her parents or psychologists, and then Elizabeth stopped talking about the man altogether. Anthony remained a huge proponent of the abduction theory for a long time and stuck by Elizabeth's description of the man who allegedly took Kaylee. Though other accounts say that the details of the man only got stronger the more Elizabeth told the story, and had the man ultimately described as a mean, heavy-set man with facial hair balding at the top and hair at both sides, smoking a cigarette wearing black shorts, though no sketch of the individual had been created. Elizabeth has since said she doesn't recall the day Kaylee disappeared. Some credence to the abduction theory is that two weeks prior to Kaylee's disappearance, a man at the grocery store was so inappropriate and creepy, Allison took the girls and ran out of the store, leaving her cart behind. 
Several pedophiles also lived in the area that Kaylee vanished from at the time. Authorities never considered this tragedy to be an abduction and therefore didn't put out an Amber Alert. Family members think a new Amber Alert code should be created for cases like this where there aren't any details about the kidnapper or situation other than the missing child's description. As it stands, there are criteria that have to be met for a missing child to be reported missing via an Amber Alert. Several beach witnesses were interviewed, though nothing panned out. No strange vehicles or people were spotted in the area either. One of the men that was interviewed, Dennis O, said, quote, I didn't want to find anything because I knew she'd be dead. The ocean's really rough out there. Rumors as to what happened to Kaylee have ranged from an accidental drowning, which it likely was, to kidnapping, to the parents purposely harming Kaylee or playing part in her disappearance. Authorities of numerous varieties think Kaylee fell into the water and perished, and that no foul play resulted in her disappearance. Kaylee's parents went on to the television show Nancy Grace in hopes of raising awareness of Kaylee, and on the show, her parents had to defend the DCF, the Massachusetts Department of Children and Families, and their investigation amid neglect allegations. These allegations were not fruitful in their findings, and no charges of any sort were levied against anyone in this tragedy. This investigation came about the concern that Allison wasn't in the right frame of mind, citing a nonchalant attitude since Kaylee's disappearance, and Anthony was okay with the scrutiny as he wanted to make sure all was being done for his daughter Elizabeth during the time of grieving, confusion, and sadness. Authorities used a 35-pound buoy, roughly the size of Kaylee, and reenacted the scenarios that could have manifested in the one to two minutes Allison was gone. The buoy went along the rocks at Saratoga Point, turning north, landing on the rocks by Cape Hedge Beach. In November 2012, in the midst of Hurricane Sandy, a pair of tattered capri shorts that matched the ones Kaylee was wearing when she vanished washed ashore in sea debris and lobstering gear at Good Harbor Beach, less than one mile from where Kaylee was last seen. Though the pants were the same size and color, the pants were unconfirmed by Kaylee's mom and unknown by her dad, as her parents were estranged and in the midst of a divorce at the time, sharing custody of the girls, but they later said that they were 99.9% .9 sure that the pants were Kaylee's. The pants were tested for DNA, but there were no results discussed in the resources I found. This is likely due to the condition that the pants were in. They were literally seams and a zipper. The rest of the material had been destroyed, likely by the ocean. Sometime after Kaylee vanished, cadaver dogs and backhoes were used at the beach where Kaylee was last seen, though nothing came of these searches. In 2014, Kaylee's family conceded that she was likely carried out to sea. There was a seaside vigil at the Gloucester Fishing Society, and during another ceremony, the crowd sang Somewhere Over the Rainbow as they reminisced about Kaylee. Something that the family mentioned, and I should too, is that the community came together and not only searched for Kaylee, but helped the family and encouraged each other to do better for themselves and their children. In honor of Kaylee, her parents have set up and attended numerous causes in her honor including a co-sponsored Children's ID Kit Building Day with the family of slain teenager Molly Bish. These kits included fingerprints, pictures, and physical descriptions. Kaylee's dislike of water, her likely demise, and her memorial all came into one culmination of a law called Kaylee's Law that her parents worked with Senator Tarr to put into place. Kaylee's Law would have mandated a color-coded safety warning system for the publicly funded beaches like the one Kaylee vanished from. New Hampshire has a system like this in place. This bill ultimately succeeded in the Senate before being stricken down in the House. Golf tournaments have also raised scholarship money in honor of Kaylee, and Kaylee's family has become a beacon of hope for others as they have committed themselves to water safety and beach safety. If you have any information about the whereabouts of missing Kaylee Ann Harrison, please call 1-978-546-1212. April 19th, 2012. I was impressed by Sasha's knowledge, determination, and willingness. Sashadri Kangala Rao, nicknamed Sesh, aka Geek God, was a gentle soul. 
A 24-year-old grad student attending Boston University's School of Mathematical Finance, part of their School of Management, in a program that only accepts 50 out of 1,000 students. Before coming to America to study, Sesh came from Odisha, India and studied grades 9 to 10 at Jaipur Town, as well as did coursework at Stewart Science College, earned his BTEC from National Institute of Technology, and worked as an assistant professor at the Bhubaneswar and was residing on Alston Street in Brighton, Mass. On Sasha's first day in America, he made it very clear he was excited about trying the variety of food offered, and spent a good portion of his first day trying different American foods. Sesh was a computer programmer on the side and had a love for the game Counter-Strike, and was admired and respected by classmates. Sesh was one of the nicest people, who was very kind, always smiling and talking with fellow students. Sesh was here for an 18-month course with four months left and three months paid internship with Fidelity waiting for him. This was Sesh's first and only foray with America. On April 19th, 2012, at 2.17 a.m., Sesh was on his way to his classmate's house to assist her with homework, as Sesh was a brilliant mind and great potential and a wonderful colleague and friend, an exceptional person known for his kindness. This same classmate was with Sesh two weeks earlier when they were mugged at Ringer Park, where several men hit and kicked Sesh when he refused to give them anything. His friend produced $10 in $5 bills and gave them a laptop. Once the group realized police were on their way, they escaped towards Jackson Mann K-8 school. Sesh received bruises and minor cuts to his face and hands and declined medical treatment. This information was provided by emails between the unnamed classmate and Sesh's father. At about 2.40 that morning, Sesh was discovered laying shot twice, once in the leg and once in the head, and left for dead close to the crossing of Commonwealth Ave at the NBTA Green Line in the middle of the street, and died on the spot. Sesh was 500 feet from his apartment at the corner of Alston and Glenville Ave at 139 Alston Street. Sesh is survived by his parents and his younger brother. He was my classmate. He was a really good person. May his soul rest in peace. He is an absolute connoisseur when it comes to gadgets, be it computers, phones, and he has a legacy of exceptional knowledge in that field. He is an avid gamer, aims high, plans big, and puts in matching efforts to achieve something if he really wants it. Altogether, a kind-hearted, adorable friend, there for you when you need it the most, says Saruba. Another friend, the Latendu, recalled a computer whiz who always had time to share his knowledge and also enjoyed badminton and swimming. I will always cherish the moments I spent with him, especially those in Kolkata during the summer training, where I had to jump from a running train because of him. I will miss all his highly technical explanations of extremely non-technical things. Nobody had a negative thing to say about Sesh, and nobody seemed to have trouble with him either. Sesh's roommates were told of Sesh's killing at 8.15 a.m., and Sesh's family only notified Friday afternoon. Less than 12 hours after someone senselessly killed Sesh, all that remained at the crime scene was a small piece of crime scene tape blowing in the breeze. The following Saturday afternoon, after Sesh was murdered, several police officers were seen entering the apartment in the pale blue three-story house where Sesh lived. They left a short time later with one officer carrying a large brown paper bag. In the aftermath of the murder of Sesh, students came together. Some thought it was, quote, a relief to see BU taking such initiative. This memorial is something I had hoped for since the tragic incident. In such a trying semester for those of us within the BU community, this senseless death should serve as a catalyst for us to reassess our values and goals during our short time here at university. Thank you, BU. This means a lot. According to another source, mysterious, isolated, 
Those are typical code words used in pathetic attempts to cover up racially motivated murders of whites and Asians, words which inadvertently emphasize the killing's racist character. The only word missing was, quote, random. These derisive and to-the-point words succinctly described the murder of Sesh. Mohan Nana Panani, Executive Vice President of the Telugu Association of North America, a national nonprofit based in Texas that helped to return Sesh's body to India, said he sympathized with Sesh's father, Kangala Sudakar Rao, but disagreed with his criticism of Boston police. He said that some of the father's previous theories about his son's death had not panned out. No arrests have been made, though a 2012 article has stated Sesha's father gave police information he believed to be valuable to the investigation. According to one source, Sesha's dad is quoted as saying Sesh was, quote, dragged out of his room by fellow students that fateful night and shot. He added Sesha's death was a hate crime. Police were provided with several good leads, but none of those leads resulted in arrest or conviction. The gun that was used to kill Sesh was the same gun used to shoot a four-year-old and killed another person, and was still on the streets as of 2014. On April 29, 2012, a candlelight vigil was held in Sesh's memory by the student body and the various organizations Sesh was part of, including the Indian Association of Greater Boston, Boston University Indian Grad Student Association, Boston University India Club, Saheli, and several other organizations. Sesh's body was returned to India with the help of the Telugu Association of North America, and the service for Sesh was likely at the Jagannath Temple, a Hindu temple in the holy city of Purity in the state of Orissa. Please call 1-800-494-TIPS, 1-617-343-4470 with any information. April 30th, 2012. Yarli Padilla, aka Azucena Padilla, has black hair and brown eyes with a possible scar above one of her eyes. Yarli is about 5 foot 5 inches and roughly 180 pounds. Yarli went missing at the age of 20 and will be 31 this year. Yarley is reported missing from Stamford, Connecticut, though she was last known to be crossing into the U.S. via McAllen, Texas, coming from Guatemala. Prior to her disappearance, Yarley was an avid Facebook user, and her last post was of a selfie on April 27, 2012. Yarley was born in Guatemala and was trying to make it to America. Please call 1-203-977-4921 with any information. If you have any questions, concerns, complaints, please email me at minepodcast at gmail.com. All one word and mine is spelled with two M's, two I's, one N, one E. Please include what your message is about on the subject line. Later, y'all.